kill you in space, like radiation and drying out and so forth. So spores might be an excellent way for life to travel from world to world. So um, if you want to go down the route of postulating that that's how life forms on a planet like Earth, is that it gets seeded from outer space, then uh, spore-forming organisms are very much of, of interest. So I was sort of combining those two um, threads. And then I talked a little bit about consciousness, because psychedelic drugs, I think, also um, one of the values of the psychedelic experience is that it reveals to us the arbitrariness of so much of what we take to be um, the, uh, the nature of our own consciousness. So, so much of what we take to be a given about it uh, is very arbitrary in terms of our senses, how we perceive things, even conceptually how we conceive of things. Uh, I think when you're tripping, sometimes you have these uh, this awareness of uh, these these limitations on our thought that you, you can't otherwise become aware of, no, it's and, uh, and it uh, melts away, and there's another reality. Yeah, and so in trying to contemplate uh, what another consciousness evolving on another planet might be like, and how they might be similar or different from us, I think the psychedelic experience is very valuable in sort of revealing some of the arbitrary parts of our, uh, the doors of perception, like um, mm -hmm. Alice Huxley t uh, spoke of it, you know. I think that being shown the doors of perception, at least a hint of them, which is probably all we ever get, um, helps us to realize that um, consciousness evolving on other worlds is going to also have to have doors. Consciousness, I think, needs doors because otherwise perception, it, um, reality is just overwhelming and we can't, you know, we'd never make sense of anything. So we need filters and doors. And the aliens are going to have different ones. And part of what may, might make it so hard for us to communicate with them or understand or, you know, um, have any hope of, um, uh, you know, of connecting yeah. with them um, might be, might come down to just a real difference in, in sort of state of consciousness. So experience with states of consciousness, I think, might actually come in handy when we get to meet them. And, and part of your own, uh, your own take on the whole situation is, is that uh, your feeling is, is that they're out there, but we're basically so immature that we just aren't at the point yet where, where we're able to, or, or, you know, where they want to talk to us. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, I, 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 we're, we're not worthy yet, intellectually. I think that's a reasonable or, explanation for, yeah. for the reason why we haven't heard from them. There are other reasonable explanations, and we have to live with some uncertainty on this until we find out either, or, you know, or they find us, or they mm -hmm. tell us the answer, you know. But um, it, one, it seems to me, reasonable scenario is that um, there is lots of conscious life in the universe. Um, there are many planets with advanced technology um, that have been around for um, millions of years longer than we have that perhaps they all know each other and there may even be a galactic civilization that, you know, we can't rule that out and there's a certain logic to it. Um, but, and it may well be that they just don't see us as interesting enough or promising enough to bother with. And mm -hmm. In Lonely Planets, I talk about the seedling hypothesis, which is... That, that's what, yeah, the, the meteor, like uh, taking the life from planet to planet. To yeah, well, no, the seedling hypothesis is more just um, our role in the universe may be so insignificant that we're oh. not that interesting. Like, okay. if, if the galaxy's a forest, right. and, um, and there, there, there's uh, maybe, you know, you think of a forest with giant redwoods, and that's what you notice. And you don't necessarily see the little seedlings on the floor because maybe someday they'll be interesting enough to, to notice. But that may be our, where we are in the galaxy. We're, just, we're, we're such babies. So, so one idea is that they're just not talking to us and not dealing with us because we're, um, you know, we're, just, we're, we're young and not that interesting. And maybe the kind of thing they've seen before and they know isn't going to last very long. <laughs> you know? What's your take on Paul Allen's latest... Uh success, if you will. Well, I think it's cool. Um, and this new prize, what is it, 50 million? The X Prize. Yeah, I mean, I... I, but I maybe, uh, maybe you could tell people what that is. I'm skeptical in some ways of capitalism and big capitalism in particular. And the X Prize is um, basically motivated to try to get more private uh, enterprise happening in space. Uh, to take, it, take the space program away from the government or make it something that 
is not just government run, but in fact get companies that are doing business. Kind of like the post office and UPS and FedEx. Yes, yes. You know, and it's there. There are definitely some uh, positive arguments to be made for that. You know, I think just having more people trying it in different ways, and you know, will spur innovation. And uh, I do believe that it that humans going into space is fundamentally a good thing. I think it's good for us as a species. Um, I think it wasn't the perspective it, it, from outer space yeah, can I mean, help us. Those first pictures of the, of the whole Earth, remember the whole Earth catalog? Oh, yeah. I mean, just, I mean, for people to see it as one, I mean, without the boundaries right. of the. You, you know, um, I think it was Fred Hoyle, who was a brilliant, uh, eccentric, um, obstinate, often wrong, but absolutely brilliant. Uh, British cosmologist uh, said back in the 40s that once a picture of the Earth from space is made available to everyone, that that will um, change the nature of uh, you know of humanity and the way we think, and that will um, it will help save us. And I think uh, actually he's right about that, and that it is helping that consciousness related to seeing the whole Earth. And what's this gay uh, you were talking about in Lonely Planets? What can you tell people what gate? You know that. Oh, Gaia. Gaia. Yeah. Gaia. 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 No, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Close. I don't know. Yeah. No, it, it's gay. The Earth is gay. <laughs> it's trying it's to natural. Mate. It's trying to mate with Mars, and they're spreading out back and forth. <laughs> and they're brothers. No. Um, oh no. Yeah. No. The, the Gaia hypothesis um, is uh, is uh, an idea about um, the relationship between Earth and life really, uh, and the new way of looking at life on a planet. And it was originally devised by uh, two people, Jim Lovelock, who's an eccentric British uh, atmospheric scientist, and Lynn Margulis, who's uh, uh, an eccentric American microbiologist, They're both absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, Lynn Margulis is uh, the mother of uh, my buddy Dorian Sagan, who's one of my best friends, who's Carl Sagan's uh, oldest son. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's some funny uh, intertwining family history there too. But um, Gaia, what what is it? Yeah, sorry. Well, I mean, it's, kind of, it's kind of like the uh, like the Earth is it one cell or, or the Earth? It's the looking at all, yeah, it's looking at all the life on Earth as a superorganism, basically. Right. In a That's certain sense, all life on Earth is one creature, and that is Gaia. And scientists have criticized it as saying, well, it's imprecise, it's flaky, it can't be tested, it's you know, it's not really a scientific theory. Um, but th there's more to it than that, you know. It's it's um, there's some actually very subtle and sophisticated ideas because it's also an idea about um, evolution, the co-evolution of Earth, and the, the co-evolution, and the co -evolution. way evolution that, that life has adapted to its environment in a Darwinian sense. You know that like if, if it's more fit, it's going to survive better, and sort of the changes in the physical environment will change life because of that. But you add the component that Earth has adapted to the life and that, that life has changed Earth in major ways. Uh, changed the atmosphere, all the oxygen from uh, green plants, and uh, changed the composition of the ocean, um, changed the, uh, the nature of the, the soil, the, the balance of radiation coming into the Earth from the sun and going back out is completely changed by all the vegetation on the Earth. So, so in all these ways, um, including the chemistry probably even deep within the Earth, um, you know, because you've got uh, carbonates being made by shells decomposing, and then those get subducted by clay tectonics deep into the earth. So deep in the earth, you've got chemistry that's different than it would be even in the inside of the planet if, if life wasn't here on the surface. So life is really bound up in the long-term physical evolution of the planet. And I think that's the real insight of the Gaia hypothesis that um, is important in the way we think about life. And I think that can um, illuminate the question of life on other planets in a way that hasn't always been, uh, you know, incorporated enough into the way that, that astrobiologists think about life on other planets. And uh, one thing I want to say to uh, everyone is that uh, I'm sure you're going to want to learn more about uh, David and visit uh, funkyscience.net, uh, but in the meantime, pick up a copy. And uh, and you'll find uh, you'll find yourself uh, feeling uh, very happy and uh, and delighted. And watch out for meteorites because these things can really hurt. David, thank you. Thanks a lot.